Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you. If you could please keep Sandra Niedeber and her sister Karen in your prayers at the death of her sister's husband, Joel. Also, Colleen Comstock, who's recovering from surgery. Barb Thingston and Doris Mann, who both are in inpatient physical therapy. Deborah Scott's son-in-law's grandfather, uh, Paul Christie, he is now on hospice. Also, Sean Smith's mother, Karen Berry, she's recovering from surgery. And then Katie Harrison, who's recovering from a motorcycle accident. And then the arrangements for Tira Scott's funeral have not been finalized yet, but I'm anticipating that it will most likely take place next Sunday, um, following the uh, Sunday school hour, maybe half hour after that. Um, so, other announcements, please. Very good. Well, let us begin our worship this morning, then, by singing our opening hymn, Herald Sound, the Note of Judgment, which is hymn number 511, but it is going to be sung to the alternate tune of Lord Dismiss Us With Thy Blessing. Confession. Uh, by virtue of my office as a call today, servant of the word, 
announce the grace of God unto all of you in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Praise the Lord. For it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and the song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. As I live, declares the Lord, 
This proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he does, has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, he shall save his life. Because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions that he had committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. And the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not just. Well, house of Israel, are my ways not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgression, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. So turn and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Our epistle lesson is from Philippians, the second chapter. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a broken and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out like a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I invite you to rise to the reading of the gospel and the singing of Alleluia. <laughs> Man? 
And they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know him. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said, to the, and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go in the kingdom of heaven before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise.
Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning's meditation is from the Old Testament lesson read earlier from the lectern. Uh, reading, the word of the Lord, who is prophet Ezekiel, is clear. I would say it's stern, it's painful, and as a result of the Holy Spirit working through it, our Lord speaks his truth to us and lays us bare, revealing our true condition. It's his word which moves us to confess the word's truth, as well as to acknowledge that the way of the Lord is righteous and just. Our Lord clearly declares that the soul who sins shall not be impenitent. Believer and unbeliever alike stand condemned as the Lord through St. John so rightly declares, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. <coughs> the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot be born sinning because he has been born of God. Thanks be to God, our Lord reminds us this morning, through his prophet Ezekiel, that he takes no pleasure in the death of anyone. Instead, he calls sinners to repentance and faith in his gracious promise of forgiveness of their sins. Those whom the Lord has drawn from their sins and wickedness, they now live by and in his eternal grace and mercy. That person, through faith in Christ, shall surely live. He shall not die. Repentance, true heartfelt, godly, spirit wrought, fruit of faith type of repentance is what our Lord is speaking about. True repentance is more than a simple ritual observance or outward confession of going through the motions, if you will. It's something which God works within the heart of his redeemed. The Oxford Confession, Article 12, described repentance in the following manner. Now, true repentance consists of contrition, that is, terror, smiting the conscience through the knowledge of sin. Faith, which is born of the gospel or of absolution, and believes that for Christ's sake sins are forgiven, comforts the conscience, and delivers from its terrors. Good works are bound to follow, which are the fruit of repentance. We don't talk like that anymore, do we? We don't talk about terrors smiting the conscience. But sadly, I fear that we also don't talk about contrition, sorrow over our sin. <coughs> What's replaced that? What has replaced that spiritual language, if you will? Um, guided by or under the influence of and pressure from the world, instead of talking about contrition and smiting the conscience, they excuse sin and deny. They, as I used the term before, poo poo sin itself. It's as though many people would like to take a, a bottle of divine white out and just major portions of God's law, which indeed reveals man's true condition because it makes them uncomfortable. But God does that for a purpose. Remember? Smiting the conscience. He wishes to use his law to do that very thing, to reveal your true condition, to reveal the way things truly stand, so that he indeed may bring you Contrition, true heartfelt repentance. Repentance is a condition of a deep sorrow. It is a product of saving faith. So if you struggle, if you really do indeed find yourself having been smitten, not smitten in the sense of love, smitten with love, but smitten because of God crushing, laying bare, Revealing your true condition, your sins. If you truly feel smitten, that's a good thing. That you're bothered by your sin, the remembrance of your sin, is a good thing. 
because that's active faith. Not one of us can sit here with smugness and say, well, I don't sin. I'm never bothered by some sin I've committed. True faith indeed enables us to realize where we stand before our Heavenly Father apart from Christ. Which causes us then to flee for refuge in Christ. To hear the forgiveness of sins announced again and again. So that we indeed maintain, as a product of faith, spirit of contrition and sorrow over our sin. And when we confess our sins, we're saying only that which the Word of God has already revealed. There's no running and hiding. <clears throat> There's no blaming others for the guilt. No excuse making in an effort to cover things up. True repentance confesses the truth of God's word. Now our Lord inspired St. Paul to write to the church in Corinth saying, For the godly grief, or for godly grief, produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief, that is outward grief and remorse for show, worldly grief produces death. What our Lord is teaching us this morning is a vital importance. But it also has great application to the life of his redeemed being lived out in a fallen world. This way of repentance has been open for us by way of the cross of Christ. Because what he has done for us and a correct understanding of the truth is something which the church has lost sight of from time to time historically. Martin Luther is known for having stated, when I urge you to go to confession, I'm simply urging you to be a Christian. He also is famously known for saying, if a person does not attend the divine service at least four times a year, they should not consider themselves Christian. Why? Because of this. Your true condition should lead you to come, confess your sins, hear the absolution of Christ, and receive his very body and blood because you need it. To receive the forgiveness of sins and likewise to be strengthened in your faith as you battle sin, death, and the devil. And this was not merely an exhortation to simply go through the motions of some pious practice, and neither was an exaggeration. Confessing one's sin, Christianity, life, and faith are intimately connected. It can be said that they should be used synonymously. You see, for a redeemed child of God, the practice of confession and absolution, whether that is the corporate in the divine service or private, as revealed in Scripture, stands at the heart of the Christian faith in life. The other thing that we need to understand is in both settings, the divine service as well as in private confession and absolution, it is our incarnational. You are truly confessing your sins Trinity. And it truly comes to you to pronounce the forgiveness and to bestow his very body and blood for that forgiveness and to strengthen the gift of faith that he has given you. A Christian confession is not simply a historic practice of the church or a pious ritual, it's a profound summary of the whole Christian faith. And this is why confession is front and center in the divine service. Our Lord inspired St. John to also write, if we say we have no sin, we do what? Deceive ourselves. Let me repeat that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us 
I also heard it described in the following manner. In fashion and absolution, the two great emphasis of Christianity, man as sinner and God in Christ as man's Savior, are brought sharply and unmistakably in focus. In confession, we humbly and sorrowfully admit all that we are, sinners in need of divine mercy. In an absolution, we receive that which God so earnestly desires to give. Forgiveness, consolation, firm assurance that death and resurrection of His Son have overcome our sin. And search the Old Testament and New. And you quickly find that confession and absolution is centrally focused in God's relationship with man. So this shouldn't come as a surprise, but I remind you that the call to return to such teaching was the heart of the Reformation. As a young monk plagued by the knowledge of his own sinfulness and the guilt, Luther soon discovered that the manner in which confession was practiced in the church of his day did not bestow confidence. And as a result, Luther turned to the Word of God and thus found the glorious and consoling truth that forgiveness is a free, unconditional gift, won by Jesus Christ on the cross and freely bestowed by His Word and sacraments, the means of grace. Luther and his fellow reformers unceasingly proclaimed this good news of forgiveness from the pulpit, in private conversation, in an everyday pastoral page. Because that's what's needed. In this good news of absolution, forgiveness for the sake of and in the name of Christ is a return to the truth which God has given this church to proclaim until he returns to judge the living and the dead. So when a person is urged to confess their sins, to be absolved, they're simply being urged to be a Christian. Doing so demonstrates strength of faith. It shows a healthy faith. But confessing that we have sinned and thought we're in need, <coughs> it's not easy. In fact, I'd say it's quite difficult. So all too often we then want to avoid it because of either pride, fear, or shame. Such feelings are nothing new. Back to the Garden of Eden. Man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed prior to sin. But that soon turned into the Lord called the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Sin made Adam go from not knowing or caring that he was naked to feeling shame that he was naked. Pride, fear, and shame not only prevent us from truly confessing our sin, they are themselves as a result of the sinfulness that we have inherited from our first parents. It's what we call the natural inclinations of the old Adam. This is why God repeatedly addresses such malady and refers to his remedy in Christ throughout Scripture. Consider John the Baptist. He was instructed to prepare the way of the long way of promised Messiah by preaching and exhorting those whom the Holy Spirit was gathering. He was to exhort them with the imperative. Repent. And the Holy Spirit moved John to preach repentance, to baptize for repentance, and exhorted those gathered to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Is turning from sin. And all the words redeemed willingly admit that they are indeed sinners and in need of repentance daily. And when the time had arrived for the Lamb of God to begin his work of salvation, he came preaching a different message. He came preaching repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And also, unless you repent, you will likewise. So Jesus' message echoes the word of the Lord through Ezekiel. The soul who sins shall die. And he's teaching us that true repentance is a matter of life and death, a matter of heaven or hell. Or put another way, repentance is a matter of law and gospel. 
And those who ignore the law's call to repent will suffer the full and eternal penalty of the law's condemnation in hell. And those who have been given new life, who have been drawn from spiritual death to spiritual life, hear his call to repent and find refuge from the law's accusation. They find refuge from the law's condemnation, but only in the gospel's promise of forgiveness in Christ. And there's another similarity between Ezekiel and John the Baptist and Jesus' message. They preached with a sense of urgency. Now this is a repeating theme throughout the entirety of Scripture. Consider Old Testament, or the opening chapters of St. Paul's letter to the Church of Rome. Both present damning arguments with urgency. Our Lord, through the Apostle Paul, declares, without exception, all people are sinful. None is righteous. All have sinned and turned aside. No one does good. And what is worse, no amount of work or effort to follow the law on our part will change that. Through the law comes knowledge of sin. So why, then, is repentance such a pressing need? You see, when you have been brought to the point of acknowledging that you have broken God's law, and that you cannot make amends by your own efforts. Repentance and God's mercy are your only refuge. Only refuge. And while our Lord emphasizes that man's sinfulness and demands true heartfelt repentance, he also assures us that those who truly confess their sins find grace. They find his love in Christ. They find mercy. And in Proverbs 28 we hear, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. The work of the Holy Spirit is to turn us away from our wickedness. To live by the grace of God. That man shall surely live. He shall not die. Repent and turn from all your transgression, lest iniquity be your ruin. This is what the one son of the gospel represented, one whom the Lord turned from the path of wickedness. And this way of repentance, as I previously mentioned, has been opened to us by way of the cross of Christ, by his life, death, and resurrection. Our epistle marvelously put it this way. In the righteousness of faith and love, Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. You see, he did what we could not do. And God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So our Lord has given us this name in our baptism in Christ. This is why, although you may not see it, through faith in Christ, this is why you shine as a reflector of His light in the darkness of this world. And He has given His authority to His church to preach a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, by which even tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of heaven. Do you see that this is really good news? Do you see the reason that this should give you joy, peace, and comfort? Where you stood condemned no matter what you did, in the deadness of your many sins, the Holy Spirit has called you by the gospel. He has sanctified, made you holy, and keeps you in the one true faith. <coughs> And it is likewise he working through the means of grace that brings you into the vineyard of God's kingdom solely by grace. So now you can truly rejoice in keeping God's law. And by the gift of faith he has given you, you then willingly and daily also repent of your sins. And you give thanks for the gift of his proclamation. You give thanks. He lays you there. And you give thanks that He heals you by the forgiveness of your sins. That's
that's how you live the Christian life. Coming into his presence, saying the same thing that scripture says about you, and bathing in the forgiveness and the love and grace and mercy of God. That's what enables you to endure. That's how he will preserve you in the one true faith. Not by his efforts, but by the efforts of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. Believe it for his sake. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, while the instrumental offertory is played, I will prepare for the second meal.
and that he would abundantly shower upon them his mercy and peace, especially Pauline Comstock, Barbara Kingston, Doris Mann, Eric Phillips, Harold, Karen, and Katie. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. That those torn by the struggles of this life might be strengthened and sustained, the poor, the hungry, and the homeless, and those struck down, especially the unemployed, that they may be lifted up and granted new opportunities to use their hands and abilities that God has given them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That our Lord would continue to grant his protection and strength to all those affected by the ravages of plague and wind and wave and fire. That the Lord would be with and comfort those whose families remain isolated or shut in. And that he would bring encouragement to them with the knowledge that he is with them and will never forsake them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That those who in true repentance eat and drink the very body and blood of Christ may be strengthened in the one true faith, and that with sins forgiven, they may serve their neighbor in love and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That we may be encouraged by the witness of those who have gone before us in the one true faith and now rest from their labors. That we, who also have been brought to faith, may join with them on the last day and serve together in God's eternal kingdom. And Almighty God, Heavenly Father, your judgments are mysterious and your ways beyond our understanding. By the grace of your Holy Spirit, show us your loving purpose in all things. Have mercy on Karen Knapp and her sister Sandra, who continue to mourn the death of Karen's husband, Joel. Strengthen their faith, ease their distress, that they may abide in your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all these and whatever other things you would have us ask, Heavenly Father, we pray for the sake of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. He 
remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup off their side. And when he had given thanks, he gave it them, saying, Drink of all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
I invite you to rise. We continue on page 199 by singing the post communion canto. Thank mm-hmm. you. 